But uh, we had a yes. big, big show uh, here recently. Uh, Ann Baldwin, the media consultant, brought in a couple of bail bondsman people that had a couple of offices, and uh, they were uh, frustrated that the Superior Court judges went to a big forum in Yukon and have decided to uh, put the bail bondsman in second or third place and move the state to a cash bail system and have the uh, courthouse take bail from people and remind them they have to come back from court, etc. And I try to give you a little insight in this, but I'd like to know what you know about this, because you had said to me an, um, four months ago when you were on that you were concerned about uh, some of the bail bondsmen were discounting their fees, and this has turned out to be a big story, and I'd like to see if you could help us with it, being an expert attorney and working in the com- criminal court system on a regular basis. Yes, that's true. I have been working in the criminal court system for 36 plus years with my brother, who is my law partner, and we have our law office in Naugatuck. So I, I do bring in uh, uh, experience in the criminal courts to the legislature. I serve in the Judiciary Committee. And as, as far as that specific issue that you raise, what's happening is for bonds of $50,000 or less, the court is more or less taking over the role formerly held by bail bondsmen, where they're going to be the ones who uh, ensure the court appearances of uh, defendants with bonds of 50000 or less. Not the, not the real heavy crimes, the sort of low-level crimes. And the justification for why the judges did that, apparently, is they feel that it'd probably work better, the crimes aren't too serious. The, there's two main problems. The first problem is that no one really enforces uh, the, the, the appearance of these defendants when they're out on bail under the court system. The bail bondsmen themselves will sometimes hire, hire bounty hunters or they themselves will work to, to ensure that these people show up in court. The court doesn't do that follow-up, so that's, that puts the public at risk. So it's a public safety issue. And the second main problem, is, as I've talked to you about offline, Tom, is that uh, this shouldn't have been decided by the judges. This should have gone before the legislature. This should have, should have gone before the Judiciary Committee. And that's what we in the House Republicans have been talking about, that this should be something that the legislature does. It's sort of a separation of powers issue. But we should be setting the, the policy for the court the criminal courts, not the uh, the unelected Superior Court judges. It should be the legislature. Well, the legislature is Democrat-controlled, and I had uh, Mayor Tom Dunn on uh, by phone. He called Open Lines, uh, a master at using the Open Lines programs here, uh, to say that uh, he and many of the mayors and people from the CCIM, the Connecticut Conference of Municipal- Municipalities, came up, and uh, many of the, the Democrats were... And, and probably the very liberal ones were looking at the uh, all these public officials that were saying their towns are overrun with crime, and he said they couldn't get what they wanted from the portion of the legislature. So is it um, problematic that a portion of the legislature up there is soft on crime? Of course it is. Yes, it is. Um, the mayors did get some stuff in the gun bill. They did get some. Uh, help with uh, judges being able to lock up uh, defendants who are out on bond and commit new crimes okay. or probation commit new crimes so some some was done the city the city mayors uh, to their great credit uh, in a bipartisan way went up to uh, Hartford and they were able to get some things passed but not everything that they wanted and of course it is a frustration there are some There are some in the legislature who feel as though particularly juveniles should never go to jail for anything, no matter what. And they really believe that. And and, and what's what's the result? We see catalytic converters are getting stolen. The cars are getting stolen, mostly by juveniles. And, uh, you know, these these gangs of criminals are are sending the juvies out to go steal cars because they know nothing's going to happen to them. And that's wrong. That's something that we we continue to talk about. And we're going to we're going to bring up with great force next year uh, in the 2024 legislative session. And hopefully we can get something passed. Well, it gets and thank you, Dave, for clarifying, because you're you're in the legislature. You're in the system. Uh, Tom Dunn, mayor, will be here uh, Friday morning at 1030 to talk about this. And he's president of this Connecticut. Conference of Municipalities, so that'll be a good one, folks, if you want more on this. And um, Dave, we had a caller, and we appreciate them. Uh, callers on topic, please. Um, 
a fella called in from Meriden and said, you know, when he was younger, anybody who any um, person minor that got arrested or got picked up went to reform school uh, versus prison. Is there any reason that we don't have reform school these days and a better system for these juveniles? Oh, yeah, reform school. Uh, hey, that's a, that's a good idea. You know, anything is better than nothing. They're literally getting a slap on the wrist. I have a cop in one of my towns, Tom, and I may have told you this before, but I think it's, it's very, very symbolic and representative of what the mindset of these juveniles is. And he said he, when he was working in one of the city police forces, he's not anymore, but when he was there, he arrested a kid for stealing a car. And he's processing this kid, giving him his ticket, right, for stealing a car. And the kid looks at him and says, just give me my ticket because I'm going to go home and then I'm going to steal your car. Yeah, there's That's no respect. The brazenness we have. No, this, no this respect. What, no respect. Dave, I got some. I got a few calls. Yeah. So let's see what we can do with the callers. OK, hi, you're on with Dave Labriola. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, Dave. This is Drew Bloom. I'm from the bail bonds industry. And I have to say that I, 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 I'm very disappointed that the judges went ahead and made this change without using the legislature. And it seems yes. to just be a continuation of uh, what they did three years ago, which was that, which was proven to be a joke. And the sentencing commission, for some reason, uh, decided to not look at the data. And the judges, when we provided them data at the uh, the public hearing, they said, "Oh, we find trouble with this data." Well, they should find trouble with the data Drew? because it shows that it's not working. Drew, he's up on it. Yeah. Uh, did you just did you hear him talking, or did you just pop on I, the line? I did, I did, but then I, I when I called into the line, I lost like five minutes. I think right, I'm let five Dave, minutes behind let Dave, you probably. Let Dave address you first, and maybe he's got a question for you as a bail bondsman. Yeah, Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I mean, the first thing we need to do is take over control on this. And, you know, there's another related, it's not a bail issue, but it's the commutation policy, which maybe we can get to, Tom. Yeah, okay. That's an outrageous yep. process, and the legislature needs to take authority over this. But these are unelected judges, okay? They're fine people. I know so many of them, but they shouldn't be setting these policies. This should be something that's a legislative uh, act. It should be a legislative uh, power to go over this. That's where I talked about the separation of powers. It's the legislature's responsibility, and it's our purview. The Judiciary Committee should be signing off on these policies. So I agree with you a thousand percent. Uh, as you know, I was participating in the public hearing. We had a lot of you guys, you know, and you testified in the public hearing at the uh, Superior, when the Superior Court judges met too. And thank you for your advocacy. You know, don't let up. Keep going. We're going to, we're back in session in January and we're not going to, we're not going to uh, pause. And, and I think we're going to see that this policy is not going to work in the six months that it'll take between now and when the session starts up again next year. But we're going to keep at this. And, you know, next year is an election year, so we're going to all be paying attention. This is a democracy, and the people of Connecticut are be, going to be paying attention to this one because it's a big one. Dave, let Drew comment. And, Drew, just repeat your thing about you bail bondsmen make sure people appear for court. Well, we do. We obviously, that we don't want to lose our, our, our bond, so we go out and we pick people up all over the country every day. That's what our guys do. The thing is, when there's nobody to hold them accountable, there's the victims never have their day in court. So, you know, people can get arrested, they get released on a promise to appear or a non-surety fraud bond, and or, or these 10% or 7% bonds, and nobody holds them accountable. With the 7 or 10% bonds, they're just buying their freedom for that small little discount, and then they're let go. Uh, Representative, is there a way, uh, something that uh, the legislature can do with this next year? Is there a bill to maybe eliminate these other-than-surety bonds? Because other-than-surety is not a real bond. It's either they're paying cash to be released, which... Back in 2018, there was something passed that was supposed to stop people from just using cash to bond out, that there had to be some surety involved. And then uh, the the other thing was that, uh, you know, if they... You know, if they use these non-surety bonds, non-surety bonds are a fraud to the public. It's just something that they report, oh, the guy was released on $50,000 non-surety. The general public doesn't know what that means. So all they think is, well, at least somebody's going to make sure this guy shows up. But there is no non-surety Drew, let, let him bonds. answer, Drew. Let him answer. Go yeah. ahead, Dave. 
truth. Thank you so much. Thank you for being so articulate. And you obviously this is your industry. You know this inside and out. You're absolutely right. Yes, this is an issue that we are going to continue to work on. Uh, you know, we have to. We House Republicans have been have been sounding the alarm on this. This is a huge issue, and and we need to take responsibility uh, for the legislature. Needs to have over this and and you're absolutely right what happened is we've got these wrong-minded wrong-thinking legislators who, who are um they're under the belief that it's more important to to empty the jails to have fewer people in jail uh than anything and and said putting the public at risk and what we say is you know it's not about making life good for the defendants for the criminals it's about the victims who's going to think about the victims who's going to speak out for the victims who's standing up for the victims well we are and the house republicans that's a member i'm a member of the house republicans and i'm going to continue to fight for the victims of these crimes because somebody has to so we're going to all right guys hold on i got a commercial break right back with more calls thank you drew let's go back to the phone dave lab you still there yes Okay, let's go to Mr. Corbett. Go ahead, Dave. Hi, uh, Dave. I've been a lawyer for 46 years, over 46 years, and but I've never practiced in, uh, in the field of criminal law, so I don't know the answer to this question. But uh, I went in February 2020 to a program, and it was put on by uh, the state, and there were a lot of prosecutors there. And frankly, they were touting diversionary programs. Yesterday, I heard a discussion because of the Hunter Biden situation with regard to the diversionary program that he got. And they said that the diversionary program will wipe out, erase, that is, his record with regard to what was a felony, uh, the uh, gun charge that he had. Uh, in the, on the state level, is that the case as well? Okay, that, that's a good question. Yeah, as you know, uh, Hunter Biden's case is a federal case, so it's an entirely different system. Uh, I can't hear him. It's very tough to get a diversionary. We call it accelerated rehabilitation in Connecticut. It's very tough to get those on gun cases. We we just established hey, Paul, would you turn up the radio? Turn the radio. Uh, specific gun dockets. There's going to be one in Waterbury, New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford, where uh, you're not going to see a on a possession of a stolen uh, weapon case. That, that's not going to happen. So Dave, they won't be Dave, having just, uh, their Dave, record erased. Dave, just back that up a little. He couldn't hear your answer, and he put his radio on. Just start that one over again, because this is really important stuff. I think you said that federal case versus a state case. Right. Hunter Biden is going through the federal system, as you know. And as far as the state of Connecticut goes, we created gun dockets uh, this year, which will be in Waterbury. It's going to be New Haven, Hartford, Bridgeport. And these dockets are, are not going to uh, have uh, cases be dismissed uh, when they are possession of deadly weapons, uh, stolen weapons um, cases. Those will not get what we call accelerated rehabilitation in Connecticut, which is basically the main diversionary program. So I don't think you're going to see a similar situation that Hunter Biden's receiving in federal court in Connecticut. Uh, the prosecutors take the gun cases very seriously, and uh, it's a problem that they are they are addressing. So, you know, it's one thing to have a diversionary program for somebody who's stealing, uh, you know, a pack of cigarettes, uh, you know, in, in a in a mart you know, quickie mark, um, that, that maybe AR is a good, good result. Uh, and diversionary programs certainly have their places, uh, in a lots of cases, but those are very low level cases. You're not going to see them in gun cases. Dave, would you give your email? So if, uh, attorney Corbett wants to, maybe your legislative email, whatever, if, if David uh, Corbett wants to send you an email or somebody wants to contact you, especially in your legislative role. Sure. It's David dot Labriola at house GOP. Dot ct dot gov. Right. Next David caller, next, at house gop dot ct dot gov. Next caller, you're up. Uh, yes, I just have a question for for David. Um, David, it, it it says now that the state of Connecticut charges seven percent up to fifty thousand dollar bonds. So they're saying that bonds that are fifty thousand dollars aren't serious charges. Um. I, the rationale that was given is that they believe that 50000 or less is not as serious as 50000 or more. 
I'm not. I don't go with this rationale. I disagree. I think this should okay, be. Okay, uh, they they, yeah. they should not be allowed to uh, use the court system in this way, be, mainly because there's no enforcement. So, but yes, that's what they're saying. Now, of course, there uh, are I, a I lot agree of very you, heavy I do, cases I do that follow are more a lot than of both talking at the t- same time. Sorry, caller, let him that. finish. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, please. No, I'm good. All right, go ahead, caller. David, so but what what I'm saying is I unfortunately I, I I pay a lot of attention to Facebook and they and they report a lot of crimes and you know serious charges uh, first degree assault uh, sale of narcotics and when you see a fifty thousand dollar bond on somebody I'm like well okay that's 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 a pretty good pretty good size bond so now somebody that even somebody from out of state can just come up and and and, and pay this seven percent buy their way out not show up for for court and 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 it you know if you listen to what andrew bloom said last week nobody will be looking for these people i i just think that this is a recipe for disaster in connecticut and you know criminals talk and they're going to tell one another uh hey, connecticut is the place to go to to commit crimes because you know what you can come here you can commit your crime you can leave and then you know what then nobody's going to come get you dave you're preaching to the choir, my man. I agree with you a thousand percent. We're going to see this in the next six months before the session starts again in January, and the public is going to be outraged. So we, we're asking the public, uh, you know, Tom, thank you for highlighting this issue. Thank you for bringing attention to this and having putting on good programs as you've been doing on this issue because the public needs to contact our elected re- officials in your town, your, your reps, your senators, the governor, and, and let's keep at it on this. There's another aspect to this issue, which we haven't talked about and tom you and i and the last time i was on we did talk about it and that is that some of these fly-by-night um, illegal bondsmen are undercutting the law they're supposed to be abiding by either the seven percent or the ten percent depending on the, the bond amount but they're taking people out for 250 dollars for a hundred dollars for nothing they're undercutting each other illegally enforcement needs to increase on that there's very little enforcement from the state this is an issue that we in the house republicans put forward we were not able to get traction in the judiciary committee unfortunately we got it out of committee but then it died on the house floor never really happened and it's it's a, it's a problem because when people are you know the case in naugatuck that guy that francis queenie these people are are getting out on by not paying um the full amount and, and in the Dulos case, you know, he ended up killing himself, but he didn't pay the full amount. So these people, and why? Because of unscrupulous uh, bail bondsmen, by, by bail bondsmen that are undercutting the laws illegally. And they need to, in fact, we propose, I propose, that that should be a crime in itself. That should be punishable for a bail bondsman to come in and illegally take somebody out, put them back on the street. These I've talked to the main prosecutors in Waterbury. They say there are cases all over Connecticut with $500,000 bonds, million-dollar bonds, serious cases, the most serious cases, where Ill, illicit bail bondsmen are taking people out by not even taking the 7% or the 10%. They're taking nothing or 1%. It's outrageous. Does the, thank you, Tom, for bringing attention to this. Thank you. Does the caller have anything else on this? Um, no, I, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that we have somebody like David that is, uh, you know, is, is trying to, to hit this head on. I, I, and, you know, and if, again, I, I just I, I listened to the show with, with Andrew Bloom, and he had mentioned that, you know, since 2020, that there was either 13 or 14,000 open arrest warrants just for those for those couple of years. And if there's 13 or 14,000 open arrest warrants, and a lot of these are are being people being bought out of jail and, and nobody looking for them. What's going to happen in five years, and what's going to what's going to happen all, in, in ten years? All true. David, thank you. Thank you, you for your do. call. Uh, next caller, you're up with Dave Labriola, state representative. Go ahead. Yes. Good morning. Uh, before I get out, I'd like to know the breakdown of the crimes. You do recognize, Dave, that, uh, and you did mention the lower level criminal uh, d- defendants. And uh, so, before I make a decision on whether this initiative is working by the way the rules committee judicial rules committee uh if you can talk on that process as well so i'd like to know the breakdown roughly not all criminal charges have a victim okay sure yeah i mean the easiest way to break it down is we have a set of two courts we call them part a part so all the Part B cases are what's called the GA courts, 
where most cases are, maybe 80% of all cases. Um, and those are the cases that are more low level. And the serious crimes get moved to Part A, which is the judicial district courts, which are the, the heavier cases. And one breakdown would be roughly 80% to 20% in terms of cases that would also translate to higher bonds and, and lower bonds or no bonds. Um, yeah, it's true that there are many crimes that have no victim, but, uh, you know, it's sort, sort of a societal crime. Let's say taking the pack of cigarettes. If, if everybody can go into a store and always steal whatever they want, it might, I guess the victim would be the store, but, um, you know, it's not like uh, a robbery or an assault. Right, but Dave, the store's paying taxes, and they should be ha- having public service as far as, cr- you know, anti-crime. So there is a victim. Go ahead. Well, that's true. That's a good point. So those those are the rough breakdowns. Fabulous. Uh, I know there was something else you wanted to hit before we switched to music. I know you're a great music fan. You wanted to talk about the commutation policy. Yes, we led the fight against the current process. We we are taking legislative control because of so many cases were really serious. The worst of the worst criminals who committed murders or in some cases multiple murders and received 40 to 60 years in sentences they were they, those sentences were reduced uh to the astonishment of the victims families to the shock of the public and it was an outrageous policy where the only concern was these particular defendants who maybe they did you know serve well in jail uh for you know part of their session sentence but that doesn't mean that they should be released when a judge listened to a trial when a judge took the plea the judge knew how heinous the crime was the judge gave a person let's say 40 years well 40 years should be 40 years not 16 years people were getting 15 to 25 years reduced from their sentences willy-nilly arbitrarily just because the guy was doing well in jail well that's wrong and it was a it was an outrage it was a slap in the face to the to the public and we we worked to change that this year and we we highlighted it and, and and thank God that there were changes made in, in both the makeup of the commutation board and also um, the policies in that the, the, there'll be greater legislative oversight. Thank God. Uh, David Labriola, just one more then since we're on this heavy duty source. Uh, in when, when, when it comes to uh, budget time, uh, and the whole legislature looks at what it costs to run all these jails and keep people incarcerated, uh, does that have an effect on uh, a certain body of the legislature that, uh, d- that is soft on crime? You know, I, I don't know that it's budgetary. They might say that it's budgetary. I mean, we're, you know, we're doing well financially right now. Is that, that, that should be, what's the price for public safety? You can't even put a price on it. You know, some of it is police morale, too. I go to the police. That police accountability was atrocious. And you've got police morale. The police, is, police are under, underfunded. There's some people who still want to defund, if you can believe it. It's the, the craziest thing I ever heard of, defund the police. You, you've got to be kidding me in this day and age. But there are some people who are, this is what they believe. They they live on a different planet, I think, Tom. I don't know what causes them to think this. But, you know, we, the previous caller talked about the unserved warrants. And, yeah, you know, the system right now is they wait till they pull somebody over for, for a violation. Oh, looks like you've got a warrant from 2018. You know, we need to give the police the resources. We need to back our cops. We need to back our cops, not go against them. They're not the enemy. They're our friends. We need to support our police. We need to make our public feel safe and secure in their homes and in their cars and their vehicles when they're going out to the mall. You know, we, we've got to address this. And this is a huge issue that, um, you know, we're going to continue to, to pound away at because, um, you know, the people realize that the, the, the approach of being, as you call it, soft on crime. That ain't working. That's not the answer. Dave, I wonder if a lot of these legislators don't read their newspapers. I mean, Republican American last week, two days in a row, uh, the whole left-hand side, crime after crime after crime. Southbury, uh, three uh, catalytic converters taken in different places. Chris Fortier, uh, people shot in Ansonia in our news department. Uh, okay, uh, another caller, get right to the point, please. We're on the clock. Two days in a row, uh, the whole left-hand side, crime after crime after crime. Southbury. All right, I want to- Call are you there? All right, for some reason, that was me. I'm sorry. All right, so, Dave, uh, 30 seconds. What are the concerts you went to see lately? 
I went to go see Dead and Company. They were in City Field. It was great. I'm going to see Phil Lesh and Friends down at uh, the Yale Ball. Westfield Music Center, great place, Tom, if you haven't been there. Uh, you know, it's the old Yale Tennis Center. Yep. Good place to see a show. I went up to the Warner to see uh, Blackberry Smoke. And, you know, the Calabrese, father and son, Bill and Brett, they're fantastic. And they do Capricorn where they do Almond Brothers. They used to do Connecticut Transit Authority. And they play as a duo all around. Uh, they're terrific to see anytime you get a chance. All right. Tell us about the potentials because I think that they get rained out at Verde and they're coming back soon. They got rained out. This is my brother's band, and they are terrific. They're going to be at Verde July 6th, party on the patio. 7 p.m. Be there, and you'll have a great time. Dave Labriola, would you give your email again? And thank you very much for making time for us here at Talk of the Town. Always. It's always fun to come on, Tom. It's david.labriola at housegop.ct.gov. Thank you, Dave. Always a pleasure. Take care. And I want to thank all the callers.